12. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in the book of John this morning. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 23 and 24. Jesus has just ridden into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which traditionally in the church calendar today is Palm Sunday. And on that day, he goes riding in on a donkey, and there's crowds of people, crowds and crowds of people, all shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, praising Jesus, worshiping him, thanking God for him. And it wasn't just but a few hours after that, that Jesus is sitting with some of his disciples, and he shares these words here in John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, it says this, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. As you can see in there, if you kept on reading Jesus goes on to let his disciples know that his time has come for him to be betrayed and killed. And the very point that Jesus is making here and where I hope we spend some time this morning is this truth. Jesus gave his life for your life. You cannot have life without death. That's just not the way it works. Things have to die in order for you to live. And for you to live eternally, Jesus had to die. But you see, for some reason, when we get to Good Friday, when we look at the cross, it seems kind of like some mythical story. Somehow we're able to separate ourselves from the very truthful happenings that happen on that day. And maybe it's because we see Jesus as this divine being. And if he is divine, if he is holy, if he is perfect, then he doesn't know what I go through. He doesn't know the kinds of pains that you feel. He doesn't know what it's like to suffer like you have suffered. He doesn't know brokenness like you know brokenness. But Jesus is not just fully divine, fully God, but he is also fully man, which means he suffered. Jesus bled. God bled. And he died. He hurt. He was beaten. He was mocked. But if Jesus is only God and fully divine and has no humanity, then does he even feel pain? Does he even suffer? Does he, how can he possibly know what I go through? And when that's our, our perspective or perception of Jesus, when he's just some, maybe, at, at the least, maybe Jesus is just some mythical distant figure in the past, that we read stories about. Or maybe at the most, he's fully God, but feels no pain and doesn't know what it's like to suffer like we do. What I hope that we do in the next few moments is lay out how Scripture reveals that Jesus lived his life, fully God, fully man, suffered, experienced brokenness, Experienced betrayal. Had his friends run away from him in his his most dire moments. He's been mocked. He's fully man and he knows. He knows more about your pain than you can ever imagine. If you flip a couple chapters later to John chapter 19, we start to see this play out. As we look at Jesus heading to the cross... John 19, go to verse 16, or we've got them up on the screen here. Here's what it says, John 19, beginning in verse 16. Finally, Pilate handed him, Jesus, over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. 
Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There, they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Those two others happened to be the worst criminals in the region. Scum of the earth. People who were deserving of what they had coming to them. And then they put Jesus, our King, our Savior, the one who was tempted with sin but never committed sin, who is perfect. They hang him on a cross in between these two thieves. That's no place for a king to be out in front of a crowd suffering, being mocked by everyone, dying slowly over the course of hours on that day. Jesus really died. He really suffered for you, for me. Even with the insults being thrown at him as he hung between two criminals, he died for you. He felt the pain of the nails through his hands and his feet. The blood dripped from his brow as he wore the crown of thorns. Jesus hurt. And he hurt for his own mother. Look down at verse 25 in John 19. Jesus sees his mother on the cross. Here's what verse 25 says. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. If you go on to continue to read, Jesus looks at his closest friend, his beloved, it says, John. And he sees Mary, his mom, there. And he says, Mary, this is now your son. John, this is now your mother. As if in the last few breaths of Jesus' life, he wanted to make sure that his family was well taken care of. Consider the pain that Jesus was enduring on the cross with the weight of the sins of the world resting on his shoulders. And he's there concerned about his own mother. Concerned about his closest friends. You see, Jesus, Jesus felt everything. He suffered in every way. And in Luke chapter 2, we start to hear just the importance and where this life began. You see, because Jesus' sacrifice for us wasn't just on the cross, but his whole life was lived in such a way to lead up to that moment on the cross so that when he died on the cross, he might actually be able to say with complete conviction, it is finished. You see, from the moment he was born all the way to his death, he lived a perfect life. And we read about this in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, verse 40. We pick on something very interesting here. Jesus is now a little bit grown up. He's 12 years old, and guess who he's with? That same woman that he saw while he's hanging on the cross, his mom, Mary, is there. And his father, Joseph. And they've been in Jerusalem for this big festival. They've been there all week. And Jesus is about 12 years old. In verse 39 and verse 40 of Luke 2, we read this. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child, Jesus, grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And if you went on to read the next 12 verses, up through verses 51 and 52, you'd see Jesus actually stays behind in Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph, being the great parents that they are, don't realize until they've been journeying for a day that they left their kid, uh, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus, Back in Jerusalem, you, you think you freaked out the last time you left your kid at like Walmart or something. This is like, they've gone miles, and they can't just hop in their car and go back. Jesus is back there, and what's he doing? He's teaching. He's with all these, these teachers of the law, all these highly religious, educated people teaching them 
But in verse 40, Jesus grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You see, Jesus, fully divine, fully God, also fully man, which meant that his entire life, leading up to the moment on the cross where he died, a perfect man with your sins on his shoulders, his entire life he lived perfectly without sin, even though he was tempted. And these words here, where it says in verse 40, that he grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom. If you were to go back and look at the Greek, the imagery that you would see here is almost like um, um, waves beating against a boat and the boat cutting through the waves as if to, to press through whatever was coming at him. Imagine a boat in a storm and the waves just come crashing and crashing, banging up against the sides of the boat. But the boat cuts right through. When we, when we talk about Jesus growing and being filled with wisdom, that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's, he's cutting through, he's pressing through everything that's beating against him, all the temptation, all the sins of the world, everything around him, beating down on him, and yet he persists. He continues to cut through in the midst of all the oppression beating against him because he knew his life needed to be perfect so that when he went to die for your sins, there would be a perfect sacrifice. His life laid down for yours so that it would count. Jesus' life for your life. Not just some mythical story. Not just God, but fully God, fully man. Suffering through pain, blood, suffering through the temptations that the world pressed against him, the way Satan came against him and tempted him, he cut through that. He kept pressing on through so that his life could be made a ransom for your life. Jesus clearly lived. Jesus clearly died. He clearly gave his life for yours. Which begs the question, if everything that Jesus gave up, gave up for you was so that you might live, the question for you is, do you want to live? Do you want to experience life like how Jesus created you to experience it? I'm sure at some stage in your life, and we probably do this on a regular basis, you've probably set milestones, markers along the way of things that would be goals that you would aspire to, to say, that's what I'm aiming for in life. That's, that's what I want to see in life. Maybe, that, maybe marriage is somewhere in there. Maybe having a family is somewhere in there. Maybe owning a home is somewhere in there. Maybe paying off student debt is in there somewhere. Maybe owning a car. Maybe it's uh, some kind of uh, goal in your business or, or your, your life goals of, of becoming a, a, a music star. Maybe it's whatever it may be. My guess is you probably have those things lined out. And what ends up happening, what robs Good Friday of its power in our lives is that we take that to be the definition of what it means to live instead of the biblical definition of what it means to live. And the reason why I think we should pay attention to what the Bible says about what life really is and what the markers of a true life in Jesus really looks like is because nothing over here costs as much as Jesus' life. Nothing that we give up or endure costs the same as a perfect man 
who gave up his life for you when you didn't even ask for it or deserve it. Jesus gave everything for you. Not just a few hours of pain and suffering on the cross, but he lived his whole life heading for the cross because he knew that that would give you life. So as I've been looking through different themes that come from Good Friday and what Jesus earns us on the cross, there's four markers that I want to submit to you this morning that really define true life. Four markers of true life. Not as we would define it in the world, but because Jesus did die and gave his life for my life, then I want to know what life really looks like and what defines that for me. The first one is this, no more guilt from sin. No more guilt from sin. John 1 verse 29, where John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you have any kind of oppressive guilt hanging over you, if there's some kind of baggage, if there's just something that you just can't let go of. We sang it in the first song this morning. The chains will come falling off. Right? Jesus died so that you might have life. Jesus died so that you wouldn't live in guilt. Which means that You don't have to do anything other than believe in Jesus to get rid of your guilt. It doesn't mean that you have to all of a sudden uh, get your ducks in a row and be perfect from here on out. It doesn't mean that you need to spend some time really feeling sorry about your sin before you can come to God and ask for forgiveness and strength to change from that. It means right now in this moment you can come before the Father and he'll, before you even speak a word, he'll say... It's already been done. No more guilt. You're free. The chains are gone. No more guilt from sin. Number two. No more fear of the wrath of God. Now you might say, I don't believe in a wrathful God. Well, then I would invite you to look at the cross. Because the scene that you see on the cross is a wrathful scene. It is gory, it is is disgusting, it is wretched, it is broken, it is painful, it is suffering in its clearest, in its clearest form. You see, the sin, we learn in the book of Romans that the wages of sin are death, which means that the sin in my life earns me nothing more than just eternity in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. It says in Romans 3, God displayed Christ publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. In other words, God put his son, Jesus, on the cross because he's a just God. And there has to be consequence for our sin. This was to demonstrate God's justfulness, if you will, his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. In other words, your sin has consequences. It earns you eternity in hell, but because of Jesus, God put all of his wrath, all of that punishment, all of the consequences of that sin into Christ on the cross, and he paid for your sins. No more fear. No need to fear. Jesus settled that for us. No more gap between us and God, and that's the third one. No longer alienated from God. No longer do we, do we have to see God in the distance, but we know God sent his only son, Jesus, fully God, fully man, to know what we go through, to establish relationship with us. Romans 5, verse 10 and 11 say this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God 
through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Not only did Jesus' death on the cross make us right with God again, but we are now saved because of Jesus' blood shed on the cross. And number four, fourth marker of of what true life really looks like, no longer captive to sin, no longer captive to death, no longer captive to the devil. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, you have been bought with a price Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. And Colossians 3, 15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Huh. If you notice, in it, number two was no more fear of the wrath of God. God displayed Christ publicly as a substitute for our sins here we learn because of Christ, now Satan has been put on public dis- display as the loser of this battle. Jesus is victorious over this, and because he's victorious over sin, death, and the devil, we now are no longer captives to sin, no longer captives to death or the devil, but we are free. And if that doesn't resonate with you, if no more guilt from sin, if no more fear of the wrath of God, if no longer alienated from God, if no longer captive to sin, death, or the devil, if you don't like freedom, if you, if you don't want what Jesus has, then eventually you'll find out that all the markers that we have in life, goals, things we aspire to, will leave you empty and Jesus will still be standing there. He will still be victorious because he gave his life for your life. He took our place. He is our substitute. I deserve to be on that cross. But because he went to the cross, because he gave his life for my life, now I can know what true life looks like. No guilt, no fear. (laughs) Closeness with the Father. No captivity to anything. But I'm free. Because Jesus took my spot. You're free. Because Jesus took your spot. The day of judgment is coming. And the Father will look at us, and if we believe, instead of seeing our sins, he'll see Jesus' perfection in us. But if we do not believe in true life, if we do not believe in the work of Jesus on our behalf, then he will see our sin. And you will pay for that sin for all of eternity. What hangs in the balance is the cross. Because it's where Jesus' life intersects with our life and invites us into eternity with him. C.S. Lewis once said this. He said, we are told that, that Christ was killed for us. We are told that his death has washed out our sins. And that by dying, he disabled death itself. He goes on to say, that is the formula. That is Christianity. That is life. That is what has to be believed. his life for your life.